Hello, everybody. It's Alice Ginsberg once again uh, with a travelogue today of Normandy and uh, the British Isles, but it's not England. It's uh, Scotland and Ireland and Wales and the Channel Islands. So it's a little bit different than your um, uh, tourist view of the British Isles. But we're going to start with Normandy. And we're going to start in a fairly unusual place. You have a picture before you of the German cemetery in Normandy. Not many people visit this cemetery. German soldiers who died uh, during uh, the battle for the invasion of Normandy are buried here. They are buried one on top of the other, two by two by two. And they are mixed between the Wehrmacht, which was the German army, and the SS, which was uh, the special uh, police investigative arm, uh, sometimes known as the Gestapo. And uh, these soldiers are buried according to rank. The lower ranked person is underneath the higher ranked person. It's a very quiet place because, of course, it is a cemetery, also because not many people visit here. And you will see that it's dominated by a huge iron cross. To give you some idea of just how large this thing is, there I am uh, in the picture to give it some scale. And this is the back side of that same iron cross. It is huge and very imposing and very black. Uh, there was a guest book at the cemetery which I signed stating something to the effect that um, the world it has no place for hatred and um, should always be defended and preserved for freedom. Anyway, something, some words to that effect. This is the church at St. Mary Gleaves. Now, if you are familiar with the movie, The Longest Day, you'll remember that a um, paratrooper played by, I think it's Red Buttons, gets stuck on the steeple of this church. And yes, in fact, that really did happen. And on this church to this very day, they have a mock-up of a soldier hanging here by his parachute. You can see it just to the left of the windows. The soldier did survive, by the way. Here's a close-up. The paratroopers were the uh, first troops to land in Normandy. And they, they landed, of course, behind the German lines. This is the interior of that church at St. Marigliese. It's a pretty, it's a small but a very magnificent church. This is a bullet hole in the fence at St. Mary Glees. And it was, whoops, it was put there in 1944 on June the 6th. The insignia for the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles who paratrooped uh, a paratrooper and jumped into Normandy. And this is a museum dedicated to those paratroopers. And you can see the propeller, the plane propeller on the ground here and a magnificent uh, floral sculpture. They have a uh, panoramas and um, dioramas in this museum. 
And this shows the paratroopers getting ready to load their planes. The, actually, they were in gliders and the gliders were being towed by planes so that the gliders could be released and from the planes and um, you would not hear the airplane engine. So the gliders were noiseless and these paratroopers jumped out of gliders. the outside of the museum on the other side. It's meant to look, of course, like a parachute. This is a cafe on Utah Beach. You may recall that there were four beaches. There was Sword, Gold, Omaha, with which we, I think, are the most familiar, and Utah Beach. The uh, the soldiers who came ashore in, um, uh, in their landing craft on Utah Beach were led by the son of Theodore Roosevelt. The monument at Utah Beach with the French and American flags. This is Utah Beach today. I took this trip in 2011, so it's about, what, nine years ago. You can just imagine the expanse of this beach and all the landing craft, and in, in your mind's eye, you could see all the soldiers disembarking. Here is the bunker in back of Cafe Roosevelt. It is an original German bunker. Notice the machine. It looks like a typewriter here on the desk. That is an Enigma machine. That's the code ciphering machine the Germans used. And um, the code that they used was cracked by uh, the British and Americans uh, in England. Here we have, you are looking down the barrel of a very long gun that was aimed at the beach. Bunkers at Utah Beach, this is one of them. You can just get a sense of what it was like to load this this machine gun, and uh, to set it to fire a huge projectile that would cause havoc on the beach. This gun was emplaced uh, quite a bit, well, not quite a bit, but significantly inland from the beach. And this barrel is pretty darn long, as you can see. This is a bunker on Utah Beach, once again. Here we are at Omaha Beach. Point du Hoc. This was the landmark that the landing craft on, for Omaha Beach were aiming for. Just beyond it, are the cliffs that were so famously scaled by the rangers. This Point de Hoc is significantly eroded since 1944. A shell has hit the German bunker. You can see the impact it has made. This would have been a shell from a Navy ship firing from offshore in anticipation of the landing. 
here we have Rommel's headquarters for uh, the Normandy coast. General Rommel was not at the Battle of Normandy. The Germans thought that all was quiet on the Normandy coast because they fully expected the invasion to come at the Pas de Calais, a bit north. And it's also uh, a bit narrower at the Pas de Calais. Plus, the weather had been very bad. So Rommel went back to Germany to help his wife celebrate her birthday and he was not on the scene. You can see German gun emplacements. You can see the monument to the National Guard of the United States. This is on Omaha Beach. The quote is by Franklin Roosevelt in June of 1941. We too born to freedom and believing in freedom are willing to fight to uh, maintain freedom and so forth. I took this picture because these children were playing soccer on Omaha Beach, and they have no clue probably how historic the place is where they are just playing on an afternoon. Peaceful, no sign of a landing craft, no sign of a uh, barricade, no sign of a landmine or any of the intense, intense fighting that took place on this beach in 1944. This marker commemorates the achievements of the 467th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Automatic Weapons Battalion, who landed on this beach on the morning of June 6, 1944. The battalion suffered heavy casualties in the neutralization of the enemy bunkers guarding the beach. This is the vista of Omaha Beach today. Here at the American Cemetery, at Omaha Beach, there is this relief map showing all the beaches and who landed where. And it is um, something that was placed here on June the 8th, 1944. It bears the uh, insignias of the local, um, the local towns showing what direction they are in from the beach. And the relief map here, these arrows are the various forces that were aimed at the beach. This is the ceiling in the non-denominational chapel at the American Cemetery. Think not only upon their passing, remember the glory of their spirit. Through the gate of death, may they pass to their joyful resurrection. As I said, this chapel is non-denominational. It uh, includes Christian and Jewish insignias. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. The flags of all the countries represented in the landing forces. The American Cemetery. What you see in the foreground 
is the grave of Theodore Roosevelt Jr. He did not survive the battle. And as I said, he led his troops onto Utah Beach. He was a one-star general. This is a sculpture at the American Cemetery giving thanks for freedom and guarding the graves of those who fought to preserve it. A battle map showing the military operations in Western Europe from D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, through May the 8th, 1945, when Germany surrendered. Shows all the different campaigns and troop movements and airplanes, see the small blue airplanes? All the blue airplane movements and the green ships offshore. And you see the French, the American, the British, and the Canadian insignias. We were there in the American cemetery as they lowered the flag over the cemetery, the American flag, to the shrill notes of taps. It is a very moving ceremony. The building in the background is where that battle map I showed you is located. Bayou Cathedral. Bayou is a French town uh, a little bit inland from the Normandy coast. Uh, we stayed in Bayou while we were visiting Normandy. Bayou is best known for the Bayou Tapestry, which is housed in this cathedral although we were not allowed to take pictures of it. Um, the tapestry is a, a pictorial uh, illustration of the uh, voyage and battle and victory of William the Conqueror over his rival, who was also Norman. Harold was also Norman. And this was basically uh, an internecine war uh, that took place on a beach in England. The indigenous people of England were Saxons, but the actual Battle of Hastings in 1066 was between two Norman forces. Back to Omaha Beach, and here you see a gun emplacement in a bunker. There was a gun that was, or one of many, that were shot at and destroyed. And what's amazing is you see the barrel of this gun embedded in the earth here. And on the other side of the road, quite a distance away, that was the other end of the gun. It was totally blasted out of its emplacement and it sits where it landed in 1944. Aromash. This is a village uh, near Omaha Beach where uh, the allies had to establish uh, a supply line. They realized that uh, they were not going to be able to maintain their forces in the French countryside because it was full of German occupying troops. So they built a pontoon harbor here to establish a, uh, a safe landing place for all the boats that would come with supplies for the allied troops. Again, this is the village of Aramanche. The insignia on, and notice it's a crusader insignia. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. This is the crusader insignia 
on a, a building in Normandy. Here we have one of the tanks that participated in the battle for Normandy with all of its placards and decorations along the side. The Norman French love Americans. If you've ever been to France and encountered uh, a fairly, I'll call it a rude or hostile attitude by the French, you will not find that in Normandy. They love Americans. This is part of the British cemetery. Remember, we've been to the German one. We've been to the American one. This is the British cemetery in Normandy. And it's fairly, it tells a fairly uh, detailed story of this soldier. He was Jewish. His name was Jay Bailey. He was a corporal. This is the insignia of his unit. And of course, it tells when he died at age 29, and it tells you he was a commando. Oh, these are out of order, and I apologize. We are going to visit this castle later. This is Carnarvon Castle in Wales. Um, one of the distinguishing Features of Carnarvon Castle, well, actually there are two. This is where the Prince of Wales is usually invested by the Crown of England as the Prince of Wales, but it is also the home of the Royal Fusiliers uh, Regiment, which surrendered to Washington's troops at Yorktown. Okay, we're back to Normandy. I took this picture to show you the intricate Norman lace that is so beautiful, which hangs in so many Norman windows in their villages. Look at that detail. A landing craft, which would have uh, hit the sand offshore at Omaha Beach. A German bunker. This is another, a real bunker, and it is a mock up, of course. And this bunker is located in the town of Caen, a little bit inland from the beaches. Some of their weapons the German map of the Norman beachheads showing all the German emplacements along the beaches. Pointe Hoc would be up here, uh, uh, about in the upper, uh, just left of center. Aromanche would be over to the right. Utah Beach would be over to the left. This is what you see when you look through the opening in a German bunker. Just imagine it was a cloudy morning. Uh, it had been raining. The uh, clouds were lifting somewhat. And out there in the water were thousands of ships. This is what the Germans looked through in order to uh, make their sightings to determine where to aim their guns. It's the Museum of the Grand Bunker. This is Pegasus Bridge and there were some uh, parachutists, allied parachutists, who um, were supposed to take this bridge intact. It was a key uh, piece of strategic um, 
battle preparation. They were worried that these soldiers would not land near the bridge because the weather had been so bad. Turned out, those soldiers landed right here on the grass underneath the noses of the Germans in the lighthouse. They were not detected. They were able to take Pegasus Bridge. The city of Edinburgh, Scotland. And this is one of the main streets in Edinburgh. This is Edinburgh Castle, sometimes known as Holyrood Castle. And every year they set up this, this grandstand and this very large parade ground here is for what they call the Royal Tattoo, which is a uh, presentation by bagpipers, buglers, and uh, military bands that perform. But as you can see, the day we were there was pretty stormy and nothing was going on, unfortunately. This is the courtyard at Hollywood Castle. You may know that uh, Queen, uh, not Queen Anne's, uh, Princess Anne, the daughter of Queen Elizabeth, her daughter Zara got married uh, a year or so ago. This is where she got married at Holyrood Castle. This is the least favorite castle of Queen Elizabeth because it is rather old, damp. Um, it's got a lot of drafts in it and um, it's very uncomfortable. Why Zara decided to get married here? No one's quite sure. This is a chapel by Holyrood Castle, the remains of a chapel at Holyrood Castle. Notice the 1960 vintage Cadillac. This is colored orange because we are at the Glenmorangie Distillery in Scotland, in Northern Scotland, by the town of Invergordon. Established 1843. Their famous uh, brews, their famous distilled Scotch whiskeys. Uh, I, with the yes, you're right, there was a tasting. The one in the middle, Kinta Rubin, is my favorite. The town of Invergordon has lots of murals depicting uh, what it's known for and some of its history. This is the uh, main street in Invergordon. Here are some of the murals. There was a very large fire here, which uh, they were able to save uh, the Royal Hotel, but it had to be significantly rebuilt. But you can see that was a major event in the history of the town. I thought this was funny because uh, we are in a place where all this Scotch whiskey is made and you are in an alcohol free zone. 500 pounds is the uh, maximum penalty. That's a little more than 500 US dollars. We have now left Invergordon and we're at a very famous archeological site. It's called Scarab Ray. It is 5,000 years old, dates back to 3000 BC. And these are some of the standing stones at Scarab Ray. They have been, um, DNA and archaeologically dated. Yes, they are 5,000 years old. And they are huge. 
No one knows how they got erected. This is the vista from Scarabray. You can see the Scottish Highlands in the background there. Gives you an idea of scale of these stones. This is me standing here. I'm about five foot five and a half, five six. And you can see how massive this stone is. The heather on the hill, you can see the heather here in the foreground, the standing stones in the background, and a church steeple in the valley below. Scottish heather. Scarabray was a settlement and it was a, a, a coastal village, I'll call it. And you can see from here, you can see how some of the um, village was configured. It was unearthed. In other words, uh, you have to dig down into the hill to find the archeological remains. And you can see the cows in the background. This is a very rural area. Scarabray, 3100 BC. So they had houses that they cut into the hillocks and these houses had thatched roofs. This is a map of what the settlement looked like. So there were enclaves. There were five enclaves here. The whole, this whole uh, thing, this whole plaque shows the entire community that has been unearthed. And these stones, these structures date back 5,000 years. So these were Stone Age people. I think at one point the Stone Age gave way to the Bronze Age for them but they lived primarily in the Stone Age. They had a fire pit. They had an oven of sorts here. They had rooms, they had stone implements. Pretty amazing. So they had these dwellings, but the theory is that these dwellings were communal in nature. In other words, each family had its own space around the common courtyard. These are some of the flowers we found there. And you can see the rugged coastline and the Scottish Highlands again in the background. Here we have the cathedral in what you would call possibly Cork, but the Irish refer to it as Cove. This is the cathedral in Cove. And this is Belfast Castle in the city of Belfast, Ireland. They use it as an event space now for weddings and such, large parties. The courtyard, 
of Belfast Castle, looking across the bay uh, to the shipyard where the Titanic was built. This courtyard is very famous for its depictions of cats. Um, there are a total of 19 cats and you are challenged to find every single one of them. Here's a better picture of the courtyard, but across the bay is the shipyard where the Titanic was built. And here we start with the cats. See his tail? Some of the beautiful flowers in this Irish garden. Another cat. Yet another cat. You can see here in this picture, if you look closely, you can see the dockyard across the way here. And yes, we did a pub crawl in Belfast. Here we are at the Crown Saloon. This is the City Hall in Belfast. This is the Opera House in Belfast. This is the inside of one of the pubs. No football garments are permitted in the bar. Don't come in your soccer uniform. Notice the Guinness tap here and the Grolic tap. The Crown Saloon dates back to the 19th century. This is the insignia in the floor when you enter. Typical building in Belfast. This is a, a pub we went to. Uh, it celebrates uh, the launching of the Titanic. The picture, the portrait here at the bottom is Captain Smith, the captain of the Titanic, who of course went down with the ship. This painting here would have been in this pub at the time the Titanic left Belfast. Biddle's Pub. Notice the kegs of beer. The Morning Star Pub. All of these pubs had lovely flowers in front of it and uh, were very decorative. Street in Belfast, where the church is located in the clock tower. It back in a pub. Pull your own, which means pull the tap. Here we have Irish ponies. This, uh, this picture was taken at the National Stud Farm where they breed Irish racehorses. Picture of my husband and myself in the flowered jacket and our Irish friend Norma by a typical Irish landscape 
close to Norma and her husband Dennis's house. Dennis took the picture, so he's not in it. Um, we met Dennis and Norma on one of our prior cruise vacations. And since we were in the vicinity of Dublin, we decided to visit them. Your typical Irish landscape outside of Dublin, Ireland. What you think of when you think of Ireland, the green landscapes. The flowers here were magnificent. These are flowers from Norma's garden. Quite something. <clears throat> and now we are at one of my favorite places in Dublin, the Jameson Distillery. This is where Jameson's Irish whiskey is made to this day. I guess you can figure out by now, I happen to enjoy my Scotch whiskey and my Irish whiskey. The famous Jameson's water wheel. This is the original water wheel for the Jameson's distillery, bringing the water in that they use to make the whiskey. That was the building in which the whiskey is aged, by the way. And you could see these bolts here. Sometimes if you go to South Carolina, Charleston in particular, you could see uh, buildings that also have this architectural feature where um, the uh, supports uh, run through the building and then they're bolted on the outside. It's a 19th century building, or I'm sorry, it might even be older than that. I think it dates back uh, possibly to the uh, 18th century. This is uh, the masher, all the equipment used to make Jameson's whiskey. Here's a ch another church, a smaller church in Ireland. This is a meteor meteorological uh, laboratory on the coast of Ireland. The next bit of land across the ocean from this installation is North America. We are in Wales. Here we are back at Carnarvon Castle. I promised you we would get back here. Again, this is where the Prince of Wales is invested by the Queen. Prince Charles was invested as the Prince of Wales on this platform here over to the left. I love this street sign, hole in the wall. Carnarvon Castle. 
It's a medieval castle. It dates back to the 1200s. The gun, the arrows, the, the, for the longbows. The longbows were uh, sighted through here and uh, this is where they were uh, launched. And you could see the statue across the street of your Crusader era royal um, soldier. The courtyard of Carnarvon Castle. As I mentioned, this is the home of the Royal Fusilier Regiment that surrendered to George Washington's troops at Yorktown in 1781. There's a museum here uh, of those Fusiliers and the way that they tell the story of the surrender is a little bit different from the way that we would tell that story. It is uh, phrased in terms of how noble and courageous these Fusiliers were. So you can see what happens. You aim your weapon, whether it's your cannon or your longbow, and you have two vantage points. It goes off to the left or off to the right. This is what you see. This goes out to the street. This one over here probably goes off in another direction. Look at those stones, how massive they are and how thick these walls are. Gives you an idea of how they defended the castle. Edward I was the English king uh, who made his home here at Carnarvon Castle. This is a model that shows you the way the castle would have looked. The door to the courtyard. Look how thick these walls are once again. This is the view from the top of Carnarvon Castle. Quite a commanding view. This is the very top of the battlement. Again, this dates back to Edward I. You'll see here in the foreground, this home, this is the caretaker's home for Carnarvon Castle. And he is on the royal payroll to uh, maintain and look after the castle. He has uh, quite a uh, cadre of uh, lands landskeepers, groundskeepers, and uh, stonemasons and so on to uh, help maintain the castle. To get up to that battlement that I showed you, you had to walk up these stairs with nothing to hang on to but a rope like this. Uh, the, this is a normal stairwell in a castle of this vintage. I have never quite figured out how Soldiers with all their armor, remember they were in metal armor and uh, sheets of uh, male armor, 
I've never figured out how they got up these stairs because they could barely see where they were going. And I could never figure out how the ladies in their long, heavy skirts uh, could navigate these stairwells. The National Trust insignia, this is Welsh you're looking at. This is another vista of Wales, very close to Carnarvon Castle. And finally, we are on the island of Jersey. Jersey is one of the Channel Islands. There are eight Channel Islands. It's an archipelago that is located very close to the coast of France. The Germans occupied here during World War II and uh, the invasion of Normandy bypassed the Channel Islands. Uh, the people that lived here had very little to eat. Uh, food was scarce, resources were scarce. Uh, they had a very difficult time during the war. They thought that the invasion was going to rescue them but it bypassed them to go to Normandy. This is a memorial dedicated to 20 islanders who never returned. Uh, you can read about the Channel Islands in uh, the Guernsey um, potato pie uh, saga of the book club and uh, the German occupation. Um, it's a very famous uh, novel that was written. It was on the best New York Times bestseller list for quite a while. And that is about the island of Guernsey, which is not too far away from the Isle of Jersey, which is where this uh, photograph was taken. Now, the Isle of Jersey is also famous because it was the birthplace of a woman named Lily Langtree. Lily Langtree was uh, the preferred mistress of Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VII. There were Jews on the island of Jersey. And you can see they were taken off the islands and sent to concentration camps and prisons on the continent. This is the view of the harbor at St. Helier on the island of Jersey. It's a very quaint, very picturesque harbor. And here's a German emplacement on the Isle of Jersey. The German, one of the German guns emplacements on the island of Jersey, as you can see, defending the harbor. And yes, the Germans occupied the Channel Islands from, I think it was something like 1941, all through until May the 8th, 1945. Very troublesome years for the islanders. They had a series of underground tunnels that the Germans built on the island of Jersey. Uh, they had a headquarters here. They had a prison here. They had a hospital here. It was a very intricate uh, labyrinth of tunnels that they created. Jewish undertaking. Yes, they rounded up all the Jews and sent them off to the continent. So anti-Jewish measures were applied by the Germans throughout uh, Jersey throughout, and the Channel Islands throughout occupied Europe. 
on October 21st, 1940, the first order against the Jews was passed in the royal court. So I was mistaken. The Germans were here in 1940. A register of the island's Jews was to be created and all Jewish businesses were to display a yellow printed notice. This was by order of the occupying Germans, October 1940. It's the barricaded entrance to this uh, encampment this, and the German occupation um, emplacement. A propeller from one of the Spitfires shot down by the Germans. So they also had a mine shaft here. What the Channel Islanders like to remember is the war touched the Channel Islands and it's an indication of what might have happened to the British mainland had the Germans actually made the leap across the Channel. It is a mirror in which we see ourselves as we might have been. This reflection is not welcomed by those schooled in the myth of the impregnability of the British character. It hits really close to home. The sacrifices that these islanders were made to have made and the lives that they lived for those five years are a stark reminder of what could have happened. Again, one of the tunnels in the British emplacement that they created on the island of Jersey. You can see there were water lines. And as I said, they created a hospital here uh, underneath uh, the island of Jersey. Uh, the casualties from British German sea battles were brought here. Some of the German casualties from the battle for Normandy were brought here. This is my last slide. Uh, I thought I would end here because the Red Cross is a worldwide humanitarian symbol that is recognized all over the world and usually symbolizes mercy and a peaceful place. Now, in Israel, the Magen David Adam is not recognized and is not part of the Red Cross. Why that is, I cannot tell you, I don't know, but the Red Cross does not recognize what is called um, the Magen David Adam, Adam means red in Hebrew, and uh, the Red Cross does not recognize them. But otherwise, the Red Cross is a symbol of mercy and healing and peace. And we should thank at this time the members of your families, your husbands or your parents who fought to liberate mainland Europe in 1944 and were able to preserve freedom in the Western world. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed this travel log. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more videos, please visit www.cje.net forward slash cyberclub. <music>